Hello, I am the Deer Runner, and in this analysis video, I'll be continuing my chronological look at My Hero Academia for anything relevant to Deku's original information gathering quirk. Which superpowers in the world are called quirks. According to my research, Deku's original quirk is a powerful scanning living quirk that attempts to fulfill Deku's desires by mentally and physically manipulating Deku to make him do exactly what it determines he should do according to what it scans for. But due to it only is alive through a small section of Deku's brain he isn't using, it has a lot of issues. This will contain spoilers for the My Hero Academia series. This is your final spoiler warning. The event I'm going to cover is a summer training camp attack. But this time, I will focus on a secret revolutionary operation and how Deku's original quirk handled the unknown to him at the time threat. Though I did cover a lot in my last episode, I believe a strong independent of the last video reintroduction should be done in this case to give us a clear view of all the relevant major factors so that the hidden factors can be easier to catch. If you don't need a recap, please skip ahead to the time stated on screen. First, this event I found the massive normal amount of manipulation that is usually due to Deku's original quirk was caused by something else this time. The initial warning sign of this came from Deku at the beginning of the attack had to have had his original quirk off due to the weakness I call standby mode. Which is, it keeps itself off to not strain Deku's mind till a desire activates it. Which since Deku was not expecting an attack and then the villains were able to ambush Pixie Bob, cracking her head open, who was next to Deku, despite how Deku's original quirk if active would have saved her easily, by at least immediately moving to save her the moment she was attacked. Since Deku didn't do anything, Deku's original quirk had to have been on standby mode. But then I looked through the event and saw an extreme level of manipulation, the exact kind I would expect from Deku's original quirk. If it was on well before the attack on Pixie Bob moving everyone into position for a planned counterattack over an hour before Deku's original quirk activated. When she destroyed other people with similar powers, this clearly revealed there was at least another scanning quirk wielder manipulating the event. So I reviewed the summer training camp for the manipulator which the results surprised me as it showed the entire summer training camp was something completely different than what it seemed to be. We can identify this by just describing the excuse they gave us for the summer training camp and how it played out. UA High decided to send out Class 1A and Class 1B to a secluded far away from reinforcements with a skeleton crew of pro heroes, which the many students were not legally allowed to fight back if villains appeared. Since it was a boot camp that also often spread the students out at many points, all around leaving them in an exhausted, isolated, vulnerable state over a planned to be few months long period of time, that meant if they failed to keep it a secret from the villains, there'll be casualties, mass casualties. But the, due to the fact that Principal UA High and the Teacher All Might would know the attacking group the League of Villains is secretly run by Alpha One, the godlike villain who made the greatest criminal organization in the past, which even so Alpha One's organization was significantly dismantled in the past, there'd be no way the Principal of UA would believe they can run the summer training camp in secret from them due to the sheer amount of expected resources that villain group should have had left. Therefore, they knowingly sent Class 1A out there to be attacked by the League of Villains and made them look very vulnerable. Which if we factor in the end result, all who here survived and students survived, the summer training camp attack plus the heroes used the fleeing League of Villains to capture all for one in 24 hours. This makes it clear the summer training camp was a baited trap. Which since the hero side would believe if they don't get all for one soon, that godlike villain will easily defeat society. While the hero's only weapon against him one for all is weakening over time becoming ineffective during the transfer to the new wield of Deku, they'd be desperate enough to use teenagers as bait as soon as possible despite the morals explaining this drastic move. Since there were no casualties and despite they spread out the exhausted students before the attack occurred, clearly the heroes tried to keep the students safe, despite using them as bait, which should be expected as they are still good people with heroic backgrounds. So now we will look carefully at this event to catch society rigging it. First, a basic description of what the training event was around the time the attack occurred. It was a haunted trail which Class 1B would be the scarers and Class 1A would be the ones to be scared, moving as two persons teams 
every three minutes, sent out along a large trail that loops back in on itself, close to the starting point. And already, five groups were sent out, and still on the trail when the attack happened. So at least 50 minutes went by while Class 1A would be in constant movement. And since it being in the right place at the right time was vital to counter the overwhelming force that should have killed them otherwise, this strongly indicates that it was wrecked. For example, the gas mask able to be given out in time plus able to give it to the metal crook wielder so he can form the counter strike in a way that can avoid death from the hidden gun the poison gas villain mustard had, the dangerous moonfish being immediately delivered to the dark shadow crook which that villain couldn't beat, the main counter target Bakko being paired with Todoroki making a highly visible and unbeatable lure to handle villains that may have made it through the initial plans to deal with them. And there are more covered in absolute detail in my last video. For this to have happened, the heroes had to have made sure the villains attacked at the right time when all groups were in position, which would be about 15 minutes after the training event began, when a small window of opportunity with the vital groups that were moving constantly would be in position, the heroes had to have somehow made the villains attack at the right time. Since there was no report of the heroes instigating the fight, but instead the villains made the first move, without any sign of hero side interference, that means this probably was an inside job, so a double agent inside the League of Villains. Which if we look at the facts, soon after the League of Villains were revealed to be run by All for One, about all those that attacked the summer training camp joined, so we should expect society to attempt to put in double agents among the new recruits. Last video went into detail on who they were, but th for this video, just knowing they had double agents is enough. Looking back at the process the heroes were assigning Class 1A students, we can see that it was Pixie Bob who handed out what was claimed to be random lots to assign Class 1A positions which clearly, by how things played out, was secretly wrecked. Showing clearly the Wild Wild Pussycats were not there to be the brought in from the outside to school training specialist as they claimed to be, but instead be there for the mission to get all for one. It is clear the society would send in a trusted group of experts to run the operation, not relying on UA, a respected, but not active key part of society's secret defenses. Society also didn't allow the powerful manipulative Scanny Crook wielder, the principal Nezu, to be there, leaving UA with no one that can pull that manipulation off on the battlefield. Therefore the ones leading the operation was the outside hero group, the Wild Wild Pussycats. Which as Ragdoll. The rank 32 hero who beat the millions of other heroes to get that position with only a manipulative scanning quirk. So the most powerful one due to she only has above average female strength with no sign of utilizing hero gear at all. Such a powerful scanning quirk can easily set everything they need up for the plan. So we have identified how society pulled this plan off and the scanning manipulative quirk they used. Which my future Deku narration theory does state this as well. This theory states the stories of retelling events by future Deku, in which whenever there is a narration from Deku, it is a future message, directly from future Deku, that the author almost always try to hide the true meaning of the words in plain sight. Which we can hear future Deku say they tried to be heroes in this event, but failed. On that fateful day, we were aiming to be heroes, but we failed, and the villains won. Which even if the heroes lost, as long as they conducted themselves like heroes, which they did across the board, they should be considered heroic, unless it was heavily manipulated and rigged, having no matter how strongly they tried, their heroic actions should not count. Since I did mention Ragnar's power is publicly known, she know that whenever she starts actively making any move, the villains would probably get on guard. Therefore, that explains why Pixie Bob was the one who moved everyone into position. Ragnar being part of Pixie Bob's team for 10 years and have plenty of time to pre-plan could easily set up silent signals to make Pixie Bob move that no one else would notice. Plus Pixie Bob made it normal for herself to be seen with that scanning device on her eye. Therefore, he can have it potentially secretly scan for things that can't be seen, potentially including invisible marks on the paper or lots, to know who to send it to sending what made to look to be glitches to tell Pixie Bob it is time to move. And what to do while acting as if nothing is a matter, with the 10 years of experience she has with Ragnar so would be able to secretly set up Ragnar's plan with the sheer level of experience she has doing that in the past for Ragnar. Which since the device Pixie Bob will use will soon be destroyed, the evidence was destroyed on what it truly was, and what kind of modifications they did to it. With Pixie Bob being the only other secret planner with Ragdoll, 
It doesn't come as a surprise that Pixie Bob announced the training event the villains will be lured into attack, before anyone else showed a sign of the training event. Which Pixie Bob was the only one shown explaining the rules and sending people out into the training event, so Ragnall clearly attempted to have Pixie Bob to publicly take credit for everything that happens in a training event, while secretly it was Ragdoll the entire time. But that leads to a major issue. How did the villains in fact get to Pixie Pop at the beginning of the attack despite she was a major planner for the event? They should have been well protected, but instead, she was taken out immediately, despite Ragdoll the top tier scanning quirk wielder was near her. And then Ragdoll was captured soon after despite her advantages. We can see the heroes ask the same question if you look into the investigation into who they refer to as a UA traitor. Due to the fact the heroes wanted the villains to find them and succeeded on not having any one of the students die and in 24 hours capture all for one through the fleeing League of Villains, which was their intended goal, we can see the main goals of the operation went well, which the reason stated by specifically people who don't have signs they would be trusted with the stopping the end of the world disaster, assumed the secret location was leaked, which is clearly wrong as the heroes were hoping the villains find them and the ones that do have the clearance never stated the reason they are looking for this traitor. So the mysterious defeat of the masterminds behind a plan to save the world would probably have been what they were focusing the investigation on. But due to the highly classified nature never stated it publicly, that situation would be extremely alarming with specifically the god level scanning quirk wielder Ragdoll entrusted solely to lead the operation to save the world that might as well have been given absolute access to everything else that might not be needed for a job as she'd be able to scan for it easily. Such a person being captured by the villains with them at their leisure able to interrogate through brutal, normal, and supernatural ways would be a beyond disastrous outcome, which since only the masterminds were targeted it shows insider knowledge, specifically targeting the key members. With taking Pixie Bob out would also lose access to massive level of information, allowing the warning signs Ragdoll is down or needs help to go unheard as Pixie Bob be the only one that knows a backup plan's details. So that does clearly show the secret reason why they pursued and believed the UA trader was there, to find out specifically who kidnapped Ragdoll. Which now we are going to closely look at the suspicious event to see what caused it. First, since everything else was set up requiring constant scanning in case unexpected moves occurred, and also coordinated attacks start with the double agents would also lead to a possibility of scanning, Ragdoll had to have been scanning and should have seen whatever was coming. But if you look at Ragdoll's actions, she acted surprised the fire started, staring off into the fire direction, leading to the villains having a clear shot to attack the distracted heroes, as everyone who knew of these secret plans would assume Ragdoll wanted them to look in the direction of the fire and the rest would have no reason to not do the same. And we can see Pixie Bob who would be taking cues from Ragdoll was positioned the closest to the villains, and farthest from the heroes. With how the villains would know Pixie Bob could deploy giant ground monsters throughout the battlefield and use her scanning equipment to know where to place them, that would guarantee they would take that opportunity to take out Pixie Bob immediately. This was not something that could be due to luck, with how easy it should have been to scan the under-equipped villains. Ragnar clearly was the only one that could have positioned Pixie Bob for that disaster. As they worked closely together, having Pixie Bob looking for any signs of its orders from Ragdoll and probably avoided outside interference as they could have led Pixie Bob away from where Ragdoll wanted her to be. Which is supported by Pixie Bob giving the leadership role of the training event, so no one should have been able to give her orders at all that wasn't Ragdoll. Looking at the other two members, Tiger and Mandalay, with them not being told of the attack, as shown in my last video, they would stick to default plans, as they assumed if the default plans were not what Ragnar wanted them to follow, she would have delivered that information in some way which that default plan would have them send all their help away as the students are not legally allowed to fight back, leaving them alone with the villains having Mandalay fight Spinner for about a half hour before help arrived, which the one that came to save them, Deku, almost died prior to that, so those actions of Ragnar could have had that battle between Spinner and Mandalay last vastly longer. Which within that about half hour, Mandalay had a strong chance of being killed by one hit from Spinner's sword that is made out of many swords. Then Tygo, who was in a stalemate with Big Sis Mag, would be overwhelmed. Leading to all three of the deaths, while all at the same time trying to follow Ragdoll. 
The only real explanation to the Ragdoll should have seen any threat coming, and adjust accordingly, is that Ragdoll did it, due to she was the only one that could have done the disastrous adjustments as stated before, she should have known of the problems in advance. If Ragdoll is betraying the heroes, her team members would be a massive problem for Ragdoll, as they'd be the most likely to notice signs of betrayal with their high clearance and 10 years they worked with Ragdoll, getting incredible massive access to the intricate and large resources of Ragdoll. We can also see Coda, the adopted child of Mandalay, who also would be prone to seeing too many details due to being with them for so long, had an unusual coincidence. Almost being murdered by the villain Muscular that killed his parents a long time ago, which if we look at the data, we can track it back to Ragdoll. Since Coda was in his secret hiding place, atop that mountain, which Coda said it was a secret and Mandalay stated they did not know what Coda goes off to, I don't want to hang out with you, so forget about my secret hideout. Coda, hurry up and come back to camp. I'm sorry, I can't come to you. I don't know where you're always running off to. The only one who would know is Ragdoll, that had probably decided to give that depressed Coda space, not telling the others before the betrayal. Then since the villain Muscular would be so dangerous compared to all the others, he would be needed to be dealt with immediately. Which with Muscular being the only one that decided to not blindly attack and try to spot target Bakugo and his partner massive noticeable attacks from a vantage point. Despite that it's unusual for a psycho killer that should be wanting to immediately start killing people at random. I came up here scouting for a nice vantage point. Here I find someone who's not on our list. This means Muscle was probably manipulated into doing it to lead him to a quick defeat, without casualties, which we already identified there had to be double agents, so that can explain who got Muscular to do that. Which we can expect a massive amount of plans with backup plans to take him down, and Ragdoll could have altered the position Muscular was sent to due to Ragdoll would need to be directly coordinating with the double agents. So could have led Muscular to Coda, taking care of everyone that can call out Ragdoll allowing her to take over the Wild Wild Pussycats operation for a traitorous plans. That also before was run by the most trusted heroes who had incredible assets for whatever her plan was, which despite Ragdoll betrayed them, she also made sure the rest of her plans to help the heroes worked showing an incredible level of loyalty, so when she comes back, being the sole survivor and inheritor of the Wild Wild Pussycats operation, she get it and easily can ask for privacy with easily obtained sympathy to plan her next step. Also since there'll be plenty of signs that was Coda's secret hideout, the battle between Deku and Muscular would destroy all the evidence as a battle would have ripped away the entire secret hideout from the mountain. And Deku wouldn't be able to report it if he died, which he almost did, so if Deku died it'd be a perfect cover up, so Deku was probably a target of assassination as well. Even so it is pretty clear Ragdoll is attacking society, the sheer level of access and accomplishments meant Ragdoll had to have been truly loyal and be good intentioned to have been trusted for so long, which handing the world over to all for one, by destroying the only power that can beat him, one for all, would not be supported by such a background, so we should be seeing Ragdoll target all for one. Which, since Ragdoll didn't use her intel and scanning to have All for One avoid capture, shows Ragdoll also is harming All for One. We can dig out Ragdoll's plan to attack All for One initial stages by observing once it was clear, Deku was spotted by Muscular, therefore without help he probably would die, Ragdoll was quickly captured, therefore this probably was part of her plan as she needed to act immediately once she doomed one for all, as all for one at that point could simply win. Which with Ragdoll having such an overpowered valued quirk all for one would love to steal, would easily have Ragdoll sent directly to all for one, solving the issues she did not know where all for one was and how to get him as quick as possible. So we can see Ragdoll had orchestrated her capture to get to all for one, immediately after she believed she killed the one for all wielder to make sure all for one won't win. Which she made it convincing with the amount of her own blood left behind. Due to this event only contains Ragdoll's initial stages of her plan. 
to get all for one, I decided we should look ahead at all for one state after being with Ragdoll for about 24 hours to attempt to find proof she attacked him. We can see Ragdoll's power was taken by all for one, which probably was not unplanned for, or it would not have happened, as Ragdoll had a plan that fully took into account all for one would try to steal Ragdoll's quirk. Which since this theory follows closely the related one for all quirk, getting a conflicting quirk from Deku when infused with Deku's hidden original quirk. We should ask, as Ragnar probably given her quirk to all for one on purpose. Since it is a mentally focused quirk due to all the calculations could only be done by Ragnar's brain, as there is no sign of additional supernatural parts, nor any other normal body parts that could calculate to that level, we should see if all for one's thought processes would messed with. When we look at All For One's decisions, they were extremely alarming. First, his entire plan is having Shigaraki lead the movement of the Hero Killer State. They wanted to reform society to have the heroes truly fulfill their heroic roles to protect society. All For One deciding to instead of teleporting immediately with the rescued from the Heroes League of Villains, plus their capture of target to not endanger civilians in a way that Stain would never condone, all for one instead uses powers against the weak forces of heroes compared to all for one to obliterate them along with an entire section of the massive city of Kamina Ward, probably killing an unimaginable amount of civilians, then inflicted incredible levels of destruction when one for all arrived without showing any signs he understood he disproved Stain was with the League of Villains. All for One also stayed in front of the, all the League of Villains, deceived members who thought they were following Stain that himself, All for One, was a true leader, which of course they see the massive conflicting evidence, in the form of the massacre of civilians. All for One is brilliant, he wouldn't have made such a mistake, then with the final attack by All Might that defeated All for One, we see a sudden smile when the attack that would defeat All for One was launched, which we can see Ragnar can't stop smiling, so probably a side effect of a quirk, which with that being the final chance to throw the match, to not hand the world over to All for One, that smile appearing probably shows Ragnar quirk control over All for One to take him down. We can see despite Ragnar shouldn't be helped by All for One, Ragnar survived in a very suspicious way, as if someone was protecting her as she laid there unconscious which happened due to the hero's brutal tactic of smashing the building all for one and Ragdoll was in to pieces. Then Ragdoll had been pulled from the rubble immediately, which to survive had to have happened due to how it was grounded into the dust and rescue operations were stopped within a couple minutes due to all for one retaliating. This probably was caused by a scanning quirk from within the villain's group as the heroes obviously by their attack choices didn't care who they killed. This would need a powerful scanning quirk to pull that off, especially since they had a giant hero just kick the building, smashing it all to pieces. This would need a powerful scanning quirk to pull that off, which all for one would be the biggest suspect with his access, and with how the heroes didn't know of this place prior to putting a tracking device on the Nomu that was sent there. So no chance of an inside job. With what we've seen before, Ragnar probably forced All for One to protect her. And since Ragnar was unconscious, it shows his attack against his mind is on the devastating level that should be expected from Ragnar's plans. We can see All for One seem to try and kill Ragnar with the initial attack, which Best Genius pulled her out of the way in time. But if that didn't happen, Tycho was holding Ragnar, who was has an extreme muscular body, elastic body, with his quirk would be the perfect shock absorber. Realistically, with Tiger obviously would wrap himself around Ragdoll to protect her, if the attack hit Ragdoll, would have a high chance of them being flung while wrapped up by Tiger far away out of the danger zone, and survive unscathed except Tiger, which Ragdoll wanted him dead anyway, would probably have died. Scanning could determine how Ragdoll and Tiger should be flung and be able to aim correctly with that information. Having Ragnar land safely far away from the epic center of that devastating battle 
that would gut the city, maximizing Ragnall's chances of survival while everything else was obliterated where they were fighting. So it would be much safer to place her far away. Which if Beth's genius did succeed at moving his allies out of the way of the attack, it wouldn't have been as safe, but Tiger would still continuously use his powers to protect Ragnall, which would give Ragnall a high chance of surviving, without serious injuries. With all this evidence, it is clear how Ragnall decided to take down all for one. By taking his mind with a quirk. And clearly, with how all for one centralized almost all the power of his operations to himself, taking out all for one's mind would probably doom any chance they have against Ragdoll. We can expect that my future deck narration theory would talk about such an impactful operation as this theory states the story is a retelling events by future Deku and its narrations often reveal future events and hidden information when they become relevant. We can hear future Deku secretly calling Ragdoll an extremely manipulative villain. This happened when future Deku narration described every one of his allies during this event. He either directly stated they were loyal, or completely avoided describing any potential of disloyalty, which he would have indicated disloyalty if they were. But when he talked about Ragdoll, that wasn't the case. He said apparently Ragdoll lost a lot of blood. But it was apparent that she lost a lot of blood. Apparently is not an absolute, just means his drawing looks like Ragdoll lost a lot of blood. Which means, due to Ragdoll's top tier scanning manipulative quirk, Future Deku is saying he doesn't trust anything about Ragdoll, no matter the evidence. And just before that, Vexibob was referred to as a pro hero, but when describing Ragdoll, Future Deku didn't use the pro hero label, and also hid Ragdoll's image till the previous pro hero was stopped being talked about. One of the six pro heroes was in serious condition because of a blow to the head. One was missing, but it was apparent that she'd lost a lot of blood. Symbolically stating, Ragdoll shouldn't be considered a pro hero. And even earlier in the previous future narration, because Future Jekyll said the villains won. The villains won. But since this was a successful trap all for one, even if they come back after this defeat, they still lost them. Which only Ragdoll, who also had been stated to not be a hero, with a brutal plans, should easily have been labeled as a villain by future Deku. The only villain plan that had the chance of success was Ragdoll, as she wasn't utterly beaten unlike all the other villains, and probably had plenty of backup plans to move forward with a top tier manipulative scanning quirk. Even so, things didn't go as planned. So we can see from future Deku's perspective, he considers her a villain, which with future Deku being a hero who fights villains in the future, the relationship will be hostile. Though, in what way, it's unclear. We also can use future Deku narrations to show Ragdoll did intend to defeat all for one, though the narration won't be as detailed as the information we already uncovered, which is normal for future narrations, which the music that has been shown previously to follow the hidden stories had played music at critical points involving Ragdoll's plan that reveals a lot. For some context first, Yarrowza had in a very unlikely situation while barely conscious managed to place a tracking device on the Nomu. Which Ragnall had lost a lot of blood at this point and captured for a long time, so she wouldn't see it coming, leading to the heroes getting to Ragdoll and all for one far earlier than what Ragdoll intended, which could have interrupted Ragdoll's plan to take care of all for one. Which the music that has several times followed the hidden story actually strongly followed this interpretation. It was intense when they were being chased. Wake up now, it's gonna catch us! But when the Nomu was called off, it still remained dark. Like something was wrong. Does this mean the villains have finished their mission? Don't tell me. But only thing that was happening was Yarrozo was forming a plan to put the tracking device on a Nomu. Then when the tracking device was being placed on a Nomu, it was the crescendo. The choir was yelling full force, strongly indicating an absolute disaster as occurred. Then later on when Yarrowza was in the hospital talking to the heroes about her tracking device, when Yarrowza specifically stated she, she did those actions to help, then out of nowhere a very dark music played indicating how bad her decision was when trying to help. It's frustrating that I can't help you more than this. I hate it. We can also see Future Deku narration following Yarrowza, which Future Deku often focuses on topics that will be relevant to upcoming events, or occurring ones. 
which almost all the other students' problems were ignored, so something about Yarozo was probably important. Which specifically, Future Deku was following everything that led up to Yarozo's bad decision, while everything else compared to that was glanced over up to this point in the series. The story focused on when Yarozo got disheartened, how she remained in that state till they got her to strongly believe in herself and strive to make a difference, which was her thoughts and motivations when she pushed through her injuries to put that tracking device on the Nomu. Even later on, Future Deku focused on a student that almost got into UA on recommendations, which Yarosa did as well. So if he got in, which he was first place, but voluntarily withdrew, would have potentially pushed Yarosa out, or moved her to Class 1B, keeping her away from the long stream of events leading to disaster. So this basically is stating the heroes almost won, which Ragdoll failing to take out one for all and her team, the heroes probably almost won completely with minimum tragedy as Ragnar without knowing of her failures as she'd be isolated in her captivity would quickly move to defeat All for One before he could take advantage of the destruction of the One for All power, which he did not know had survived. Which Future Deku believes Ragnar would have beaten All for One if it wasn't for Yara Rosa stopping it by interfering with that tracking device. And with what we saw of what Ragnar did to All for One, he was probably in trouble. And we are going to get a bit more deadly details about this later on in this video. We can hear another future narration also strongly support the disaster caused by Ragdoll in a pretty direct way, but of course, in a way to not have you realize what it said. This future narration specifically said that during the USJ and Hosu event, they thought they saw true evil, but didn't mention the summer training camp attack. After the USJ and Hosu attacks, we thought we'd seen true evil, that the worst was over. Which means in the most literal terms, they mistaken something to be true evil in both the Hosu and USJ incident, but in the summer training camp attack, that did not happen. Since in all three attacks the same group were attacking them and that group, the all for one criminal organization, is a main enemy of the series, the future narrations shouldn't be saying that in the summer training camp, they should be considered true evil, while in the other ones, they weren't, unless something drastic had changed. Which we can see the biggest difference created by the summer training camp attack is that Ragdoll altered All for One's mind, which had him throw out the massive restraint he showed the world as he tried to conquer it, without destroying, making his conflict stakes far higher than they ever were before the summer training camp attack. Therefore, that is enough to be the difference between then and now, in regard to them being considered true evil. Now let's look into why Ragnall betrayed the heroes. Ragnall does want to defeat society despite the sheer level of trust she rightfully earned by how no one with that sheer level of access Ragnall has could have intended to betray society when they received access, but at some point turned on them. We can see with the tension in society building up to an eventual civil war by how future events happened and Ragnall being one of the few that would have been given all the details, so a clear view of the problems disheartening her as the problems kept growing. While also society higher-ups had done many brutal actions to keep control due to the sheer amount of superpowers made the world couldn't handle the tension humanity faced throughout their history due to the sheer power of the mob that would form. They brutally covered up massive events shown by how they covered up the very existence of the greatest villain organization that is led by a godlike villain, all for one, reducing that very real threat to a mere urban legend. So many bad things had to have happened to pull that off. And had implemented heavy level of censorship and propaganda. It was dirty work, which with how they tried to have Ragdoll save the world, Ragdoll had to have done countless operations for them, earning the rank 34 out of the millions of heroes through this. We can expect Ragdoll's hands are drenched in blood, but as the problems grew with the suppressed discontent growing and the amount of dark things she did in the name of the greater good for this slowly sipping away peace would lead to Ragdoll being demoralized, but determined to protect society with how much she already did for them. But then, with All for One coming back, she realized it was all for nothing. That with one for all soon to be down as it's being transferred, all for one will probably win. And that those people that performed all those brutal actions 
maintaining their control over their populations have failed. Then came to Ragnar and told her to defeat All for One to keep them in control due to she ran the operation that got All for One in the future. But the sheer level of failures and the many grievances of the population not being addressed and ignored with the sheer intricate details Ragnar knew. At that point, she'd be prone to not wanting to give them another chance. In her view, those fools led society to its destruction, and if they maintain control, society will continue to slowly rot away. Under their rule, which, unlike anyone else in the world, she had the ability to save it or destroy it, and a possibility to start over in some way with a full access and massive resources, plus a top-tier scanning quirk to maximize her effectiveness. But Ragnall would probably need a large base of operation, like the Wild Wild Pussycats operation, to have the influence to build something from whatever tactic she's decided on, and the defeat of the godlike powers that be able to bring whatever she can make to its knees would need to be handled. So this does explain what she's trying to do. But even so, her plan partially failed. I doubt she is going to give up, and she probably has a backup plans. Which, there is an ominous future narration that supports the continued pursuit of her goals, leading to devastating results. Future Deku stated the summer training camp couldn't have been more of a disaster. The summer training camp we'd all been looking forward to couldn't have been more of a disaster. Which, since these types of stories, the final battle usually contains the worst events, and it didn't happen here, the summer training camp setting the final battle into motion would meet the requirements of that statement. Which, since Ragnall's plans were set into motion that directly messed with the god-level powers of that world, so has the potential to cause the worst disaster in the world's history, and the rest of the villains would defeat it and only can regroup at that point. Ragdoll's plans would be the only answer. With a look at Ragdoll and Deku, two dangerous scanning quirk users, we can see both have, at least if we take into account the impact of Deku's original quirk, lack of morals, going to extremes. Both have the same category of superpowers, and both chose to heavily get involved in one-for-all and all-for-one situation. So, some similarities, but also when we put them side-by-side, side, we also see shared green hair, though one is darker and white skin, which since my future Deku narration theory states Deku's mom passed this quirk to Deku and has the green hair and white skin, these similarities of life choices, powers, and physical features does bring the question of a potential blood relations. To go for the basic biology view, quirks are passed on primarily by blood relations. So ones of similar power should have similar physical features, such as the green hair and white skin. But clearly, there is a massive difference in usability of the same category quirk, which there is a concept known as mutations, which a very small change occurs that can cause drastic differences between two directly related quirk wielders. Looking at what caused the usability issue in Deku's form, it was caused by how it is alive to a multi-personality disorder, having both individuals in a shared brain use completely separate brain parts and not directly interact with each other. Which a small amount of brain parts Deku's retrocook has access to cause the major issues it has while Deku's personality is very healthy. Due to Deku uses most of his brain parts to exist, but if we look at Ragdoll, she obviously is very crazy with her smiling, happy, strange behavior, but her quirk is top tier and amazing, which can be caused by a different distribution of brain parts, favoring the opposite one instead of the other one which Deku had a full scan for a quirk, which should have contained a brain scan as he was analyzed by a secretly top-tier person that can search for quirks, showing no abnormality in his brain. Therefore, that separation of brain parts is physically so small that if they are related, then that change would be physically small enough that a mutation can explain the difference between Ragdoll and Deku. Though we don't know if Ragdoll has a multi-personality disorder, if you look at Ragnall's description of a quirk, it isn't really helpful with the lack of details in the name she gives it. Search, which is a basic name we can expect a scanning quirk to have. I'm Ragdoll and my quirk is Search! I can look it up to a hundred people and know everything about them, like their location and weakness! But the hero named Ragdoll is very noteworthy. 
because if you look up the definition of ascribing a person as a ragdoll, this refers to a person that is dependent on someone else to decide what to do to an extreme extent as a way of life, which is a pretty good description to describing Deku and his original quirk relations. Deku's original quirk often tries to control Deku deciding for him, which with the hero named Ragdoll stating herself as dependent on a quirk, which with Ragdoll being at a more notable lesser mental state with an insulting name can be a direct reference to less amount of brain parts and gives a name such to her quirk that indicates it fulfills its purpose properly could be indicating more brain parts, having it have a good mental state, reaching its true potential, which we can find more supporting evidence if we look back at the future narrations, saying the villains won with an S at the end of the word villains. On that fateful day, we were aiming to be heroes, but we failed and the villains won. Meaning more than one. But since Ragdoll would probably not risk bringing anyone else with her horrifying tactics till she establishes herself with taking over the Wild Wild Pussycats operation, and probably cover up the dark steps of her plan before a recruitment phase started, especially since she is betraying some extremely well-connected people, basically the entire government and any world governments at this point that are out there, recruiting a single person could be very problematic. The S at the end of the word villains would be fulfilled if we conclude the other person in Ragnar's head, a multi-personality, and this would explain when in Kamino Ward when a smile just before all for one defeat, when he needed to be defeated, that strongly indicated a manual activation, as a person who did it would have to be the other person in Ragnar's mind, successfully being transferred to all for one, as Ragnar with a quirk taken couldn't do it herself. And with Ragdoll unconscious, it would be more realistic for Quirk forced all for one to protect Ragdoll from the heroes, as there'd be no way for Ragdoll to directly ask for help, with her being unconscious. We can also see when all for one takes or gives Quirks, people were shown to not lose consciousness, but Ragdoll was completely comatose, which can be explained by when the Quirk was removed, the multi-personality was taken as well, from her mind, causing an unimaginable amount of brain disruptions. As we can observe, Ragdoll's quirk on its own controlling all for one, making complex decisions, assisting Ragdoll, therefore it was transferred to all for one. One last way we can look for this is that they are related, there should be some rules both must follow, and the more the wild similarities can, if strong enough, basically conclusively prove they are related. Which we can actually catch that Ragdoll smiling is the key to this. We can see Ragnarok can't stop smiling, showing a probable side effect of the quirk, with how abnormal it is, and how it was a probable sign of harming off one during his defeat. And for future Deku narrations, he does often talk about he wants to show a heroic smile that brings hope, which may have a hidden meaning, such as the smile, if done by his quirk, is a symbol of fear and pain. But at first glance, it doesn't seem Deku has a smiling side effect until we see his original quirk go to the absolute extremes. In chronological order, during the Sludge Monster incident, Deku's original quirk had it use full physical manipulation over Deku's body, forcing him to run as Deku watched his body move on its own, screaming in his head, why is this happening, with a massive mental manipulation trying to suppress Deku's mind. Constantly, to lead him around and get him confused on the reason his body moved on its own which he observed clearly the uncontrolled full sprint, which was successful as Deku thought he wanted to save Bakugo, which doesn't make sense as Deku in his mind was screaming, why was he doing that? Then shortly after, Deku smiled. Next event, Todoroki vs Deku in the UA Sports Festival. His quirk inflicted massive injuries on Deku, forcing Deku to continue with massive physical and mental manipulation. Also, once Todoroki gave in to using his flame quirk, Deku was mentally manipulated to not hold back, to launch killing attacks, which ones running the tournament desperately tried to stop. Which Deku smiled soon after, Todoroki gave in to using his fire quirk, completing the plan that was holding back the brutal win plan. In a final exam, with Deku's partial broken back, a heavy level of physical manipulation with mental manipulation forced Deku to not understand the severity of his injuries, and kept his broken body moving which had Deku go back for the plan to carry the heavy Bakugo through the escape gate, and attack All Might in that broken state. We soon after Deku started pushing his body to extremes, Deku smiled. And lastly, in this moment training camp, 
After beating Muscolo with Deku's body permanently damaged, he thought of getting Koda to the fire to put it out, which probably wouldn't work and get him ambushed, as how obvious such an action would be, which he didn't know he had Uskeni Quirk, but instead knew his body was finished, unable to defend itself properly, so heavy level of Quirk activity with physical manipulation keeping Deku on the battlefield with bizarre logic, a side effect of massive mental manipulation, which as Deku talked to Koda, describing his bad ideal, a smile appeared. Every time Deku's original quirk went to absolute extremes, a smile appeared shortly after, so this does look like Ragdoll and Deku have the same underlying smiling side effect, especially since for Deku's form, it follows a strict order of events, heavy physical and mental manipulation combined with forced bizarre logic has a smile appeal shortly after, but Ragdoll can't help but smile constantly, while Deku's original quirk makes Deku smile when he goes to extremes. That could be due to the opposite nature of how brain parts are distributed, having one active all the time while the other is heavily suppressed. So with this and everything stated before, we can conclude Deku and Ragnall are blood related. Now since the entire muscular event was highly controlled by the UA trader Ragdoll, I had decided to not go into detail in the last video that also covered the summer training camp attack, but skipped over the UA trader. But now with a clear understanding of the factors around that event, we are going to analyze how Dex's original quirk handled that assassination attempt. Since Koda kept his far away isolated hiding spot a secret, so only Ragdoll would know of it before scanning, and prior to this, decided to just give that emotionally injured child space, not telling anyone else about that place. Ragdoll could easily corner Koda though, if the need ever arises, but that isolated hiding spot could not hide from Deku's original quirk, long range scanning. Which, with Deku desiring to help that troubled child Koda, forcing Deku to become aware of useful information, for the plan that did include that isolated location, this made that place a perfect spot to, without any chance of outside interference, lure then eliminate both of them discreetly. Which, Ragnall had plenty of opportunities to easily lead them there. First, emotionally damaged Kodo, who hates heroes, while surrounded by heroes, could easily be riled up by Ragnall tricking Kodo to head out there. Which Kodo was used to having Ragnall around, so can approach Kodo in many ways, not suspiciously. But then Ragnall would need to give Deku's original quirk a reason to head out there, which sending a villain to Kodo would easily have Deku's original quirk force Deku to head there, as no matter what villain was chosen, due to Kodo's age, he wouldn't be able to defend himself, dying quickly, making Deku's original quirk prioritize Kodo over everything else. Which Ragnall could send an overwhelming powerful person there, and Deku would still come due to the normal rules of Deku's original quirk plans in every large scale situation protect the most in need. And then everything else was a secondary objective. Plus, due to the thick forest, Deku's original quirk had plenty of options at it approached, so wouldn't believe it had no chance to man the threat. Which through the double agents in the League of Villains, Ragdoll could move the attack through Koda's secret area location, which the rest of the heroes would not know of the significance of the area as it was kept a secret. The chosen villain was Muscula, who long ago killed Koda's parents, which during that battle, Koda's parents took one of Muscula's eyes, and is a reported psycho killer that loves killing people. Waterhouse, two heroes sharing one name, ended by one criminal's heinous actions. The suspect sustained a major injury to his left eye during his fight with Waterhouse. Which Muscula was already watching Koda when he got scanned. So Deku's original quirk would obviously prioritize Koda no matter what else is happening, for how easily that situation could quickly go bad. Looking at how Ragdoll got muscular there, due to society's plan, including safeguarding the students, use his bait, they would implement special plans for any villains, that would be deemed far too dangerous for the heroes out there. We can see that for the psycho killer Moonfish, he was immediately sent to the campy beat by him Dark Shadow and Choji combination that would be able to detect any ambush coming allowing Dark Shadow's activation, which would destroy Moonfish. Which if Moonfish ran, it would go to the invincible, easily fought in main capture target location Bakugo and Todoroki, and have Deku's original quirk lead Dark Shadow to him. So an immediate plan to take out Moonfish while also never letting him touch defenseless targets, and if he survives the first attempt, multiple additional plans to make sure Moonfish goes down would follow. Which we can expect there was even more backup plans as Aizawa who can suppress quirks was around, which he easily would have destroyed Moonfish. Muscular going against his nature looking at a vantage point for the signs of Bakugo 
and Todoroki easily spottable attacks would make Shoi muscle ahead directly to them, skipping past all the people he should have wanted to slaughter for no reason, which instead go to the being burned and frozen to death scenario while being ripped asunder by explosions. I came up here scouting for a nice vantage point, and here I find someone who's not on our list. With also Aizawa nearby able to suppress Muscular's quirk which allowed battle sounds of Muscular punching through the ice, would attract Aizawa's attention. But also Deku's version of quirk was around, ready to intervene. So that clearly looks to be the plan for Muscular, which the double agents would be able to manipulate Muscular to use a vantage point. We can also basically prove it as well because as the plans for the summer training camp never showed Aizawa being used, which he is overpowered and should have been expected to be sent to at least one of the overpowered villains. Which dealing with Muscular would be the most likely primary plan due to the other overpowered villain was clearly being targeted already with Dark Shadow to get him, which with Muscular's early defeat at the vantage point area far away from Aizawa, this would explain why Aizawa did not have anything to do. And looking closely at Zara's actions, we can see he understood something went wrong with society's plans. Though Aizawa would not be allowed to give orders while the plan was led by two scanning crooks, we can expect society higher-ups would approach him and tell him to back off in some way. This would explain why Aizawa sent Deku to Mandalay to implement plans for the heroes to fight back, as that order would come through a person whose word must be followed. Even if Aizawa wasn't told the details, he has an impressive, trustworthy background, and he easily agreed to help our operation to save his students from the attacks that have been occurring, so should have been recruited. Which, over time during the operation, he would have noticed he was underutilized, and Deku was severely injured, obviously almost died, which completely conflicts with the deal he made as Aizawa should have been sent there to help. So Aizawa could see something went horribly wrong. Which Aizawa used Deku's secret authority to as best he can have everyone respond in a way to abandon society's failed plan. By having them all fight back full force, which was done by having Deku use Mandalay's telepath ability to tell everyone to fight back as Aizawa knew Mandalay could not say no to that order as it came from Deku. I've got a message from Mr. Aizawa! We need you to use telepath! Tell everyone in Class A and Class B that Eraserhead has granted them permission to engage in combat with the villains! Which is supported by Manalei after seeing Deku's severe injuries that clearly was inflicted, while saving the child Koda meant they needed to fight back. But she was worried about something such as potentially breaking Ragnar's plans. I hope you know what you're doing, Eraser. Though much of what we have found out about Aizawa was not directly said, my future Deku narration theory can explain this. Due to this theory states, this story is a retelling of events by future Deku, which future Deku avoids saying things he doesn't know about, and with how society did fulfill the objectives that Aizawa agreed to, Aizawa would be compelled to predictably honor the keep this matter classified as much as possible, so Aizawa, when describing what he did to Future Deku, left out a lot of details, which since Aizawa is truly a person that Future Deku would trust, Future Deku accepted this, but there was enough left for Future Deku to figure out what probably happened, so Future Deku only showed directly what Aizawa was willing to tell Future Deku, then indirectly states the parts that Future Deku suspects was hidden, which since we were able to dig it out, then that is what probably had happened, which is normal behavior of Future Deku narration theory. With Ragnall knowing that whole plan to take out Muscular, Ragnall took advantage of the plan and simply told the double agents to send Muscular to the area that unknown to them had Coda's secret hideout, while they thought it'd be an unoccupied vantage point to start the plan to deal with Muscular. Then the battle between Muscular and Deku would tear the entire secret hideout from the side of the mountain, destroying all physical evidence of his connection to Coda. Which as long as Deku and Coda died, there'd be nothing that could link their deaths to Ragdoll, especially since she fell just before they started fighting, but already facing each other. Having Ragnall be able to say she was prevented from addressing the miscalculation with backup plans explaining the tragedy. So that was Ragnall's plan, to get them there and to avoid suspicion. With this, we now look at the event from start to finish for the rest of the details. With the stated before way Ragnall lured Deku and Koda out there, Deku's original quirk knew it'd probably lose to Muscular, so it'd be far better if he let Muscular go if he doesn't attack Koda, to head to the easy to see Baku and Todoroki location, to get killed by the fire and ice attacks, 
and potentially with the help of Deku with reinforcements heading to the loud, obvious battle location. Which was the original secret plan to deal with Muscula, having that sound of battle bring Aizawa though dooming Muscula. Basically it wanted to choose a far more advantageous battlefield to deal with Muscula, which had plenty of powerful allies instead of an easily killed in the crossfire child, making Deku hold back and accept taking direct hits to avoid that child from being directly attacked. But instead of Muscula leaving, Muscula decided to for fun kill Koda, without realizing who Koda was, forcing Deku's original quirk to send Deku in, with a last second save as it had kept Deku close by hoping Muscula would leave to avoid that fight, while at the same time, make sure Deku would be there if things went bad. Which is one of the more common strategies of Deku's original quirk, holding Deku back then sending Deku in when it'd be the best time for him to arrive. Since Deku's original quirk knew Deku would realistically try to use his cell phone that'd probably lead to other people that only get quickly killed to come over, and Ragnar was still up which she'd be able to send in proper help Deku's way, Deku's original quirk without realizing that Ragnar was betraying them decided to with that last second save of Koda have muscular attack break Deku's cell phone to not have Deku wonder why he didn't try to use his cell phone to ask for help, to avoid doing something obvious bringing attention to itself. As it normally tries to avoid being spotted at all, Deku's original quirk also didn't let Deku tell Manly and Taigo where he was going to further keep others away from that death trap for their own good. I didn't tell anyone where I was going, which means I can't hope for reinforcements to show up. Which Manly probably picked up on the fact Deku's original quirk had a reason to try to not tell her. So Randley didn't ask where Deku was going, which Randley should have if that wasn't the case, as that should have been one of the first responses to Deku saying he knows the location of Koda. Unless Mandalay had a reason to not say anything, as Mandalay knew not to interfere with a scanning quirk plan, that it knows far more than she does. With Deku now stuck with Muscular as he couldn't outrun him, which during the training dragged a war out Deku making sure Deku would not run. If we can just get back to camp, but... I'm so tired from the training today, it won't work. Ragnar was sure that God level power, one for all, would be destroyed, so Ragnar headed to a secret off screen villain force to be captured and taken directly to all for one, so that she can make sure that other God level power won't be a threat to her future plans either. If we look at the evidence of how Ragnar was taken out, a clear cover up can be seen by a secret villain force. Ragnar's blood was found at the halfway table a vast distance away from where she was last seen at the opposite side of the trail starting point when the attack started, which she didn't insist anyone along the way, so Ragnar was focused on something off screen. And then the Nomu was found with her broken bloody equipment, but since that Nomu would be far too stupid and powerful to not kill Ragnar if it caused that amount of blood of hers to be spilt, that means that Nomu couldn't have took Ragnar out. While also since none of the villains took credit, it had to have been a hidden villain group that is trying to not get spotted, by this time giving the credit to the Nomu that isn't able to tell anyone it didn't do it, due to the normal severe mental deficiencies of the Nomus. Which a strange path Ragnar took shows she probably was trying to trick the hidden force to take the bait with a convincing act that had her lose a lot of blood, which they did fall for it, guaranteeing a within 24 hours direct delivery to all for one as Ragnar was found in the building all for was in within 24 hours. We can see why this hidden villain force was there. First, Shigaraki the incompetent and proven to be incompetent leader of the League of Villains was back to a corner. Despite he was chosen to be the inheritor of the godlike powers of all for one and the criminal organization all for one runs, Shigaraki's massive amount of failures with every mission he publicly been a leader of has had his forces suffering great losses and always fell. If he was to demonstrate the same level of failure here, which this time the high-end criminal organizations supplied him with many top-of-the-line villains that were facing spread-out exhausted heroes, his reputation would be unrecoverable. Shigaraki needed a victory here, so All for One would of course send in a force to make sure Shigaraki wins, a overwhelming powerful force that will guarantee victory. But since having Shigaraki taking the most amount of credit as possible is important, this group would attempt to hide the presence, explaining why when they captured Ragdoll, they worked hard to give all the credit to the Nomu, which can't tell anyone what it saw, due to Nomu's normally destroyed mental state. So that makes it not only all for one would be tempted strongly to steal Ragdoll's quirk, 
he'd be forced to bring her directly to him due to all for one can't afford to let anyone find out about how Ragdoll was actually captured. So now that we have seen how Ragdoll set Deku up, we move to when Muscula and Deku start fighting. The first one to make a move was Muscula, but since Deku was right next to Koda, this had effectively limited Deku's original quirk movement options to make sure the attack hits Deku directly to avoid hitting Koda. This broke Deku's arm, then Deku managed to move the battle away from Koda, which when he did, Muscula hit him many more times but failed to do the severe damage that happened before. When Deku's original quirk had decided to take the full hit to protect Koda, which you can easily see Muscular's attacks were not any less powerful with how it was tearing apart the rock wall and floor, yet Deku's body was able to hold together unlike when Deku's original quirk was forced to not dodge. Which means we discovered a new ability of Deku's original quirk, as it is shown that he can move Deku's body to direct and reflect the attack energy enough to avoid serious injuries. Which technically we have seen Deku's original quirk physical manipulation, insane accuracy and movements reduce Deku's injuries, but not to this scale. Now getting back to the fight, with how Muscular was showing he was only interested in Deku after he broke Deku's arm and basically only talked instead of Deku, Deku's original quirk saw it didn't need to guard Koda, and to keep Deku away from Koda to keep Muscular's focus off of him, which it then focused on Deku's survival and taking out the threat. It would go to the strategy seen before when facing overwhelming opponents. They can easily dodge or take full force one for all attacks. Which it avoids using full powered attacks to not break Deku's body for a slight chance of victory. So we can expect Deku's original quirk will be looking for weaknesses and will attempt to exploit them throughout the match instead of just fighting full force at Muscular. With how outmatched this scans determined Deku to be, Deku's original quirk allowed Muscular to attack and come to Deku instead of charging at Muscular, as that would only hurt Deku severely far quicker. Muscular also decided to talk a lot before attacking, which during this time, Deku's original quirk would have activated the pain reduction if it hadn't already and physical manipulation to keep Deku's body moving the best it can with the damage received. After that, Muscular charged at Deku from a distance, allowing Deku's original quirk to see how to avoid the attack. When Deku dodged, he went in the air, but Muscle was so fast before Deku could land from that dodge, he attacked Deku in the air, which Deku smashed into the rock wall, partially breaking the solid rock wall, but this time there was no broken bones due to Deku's original quirk had no restrictions on determining how to, through physical manipulation of Deku, direct the impact through Deku's body. But even so, his bones weren't broken, there was still a large impact going through Deku's body. Having Deku stunned on the ground needing his original quirk to adjust the pain reduction and physical manipulation to get Deku moving again, leaving Deku stunned. But at this point, Muscle again talked a lot, not attacking, allowing Deku's original quirk to activate physical manipulation with pain reduction. But Deku seemed to remain stunned for longer than he should have. And if we look at Muscle, he had his arm outstretched, leaving himself vulnerable as he approached, taunting Deku, which Deku's original quirk has several times before he kept Deku down, waiting for the perfect time to attack, and also made Deku look helpless so the opponent would play around just like how Muscle was doing. So it doesn't come as a surprise that Deku suddenly attacked when Muscle was right next to him. Deku's original quirk would be expected with that attack to have been aiming for a way to cause max damage, which had to be something not requiring full power due to Deku didn't use it, which we can see Muscle has an insane amount of moving muscular fibers, which are constantly forming and deforming. So technically it should be possible to with the power Deku use and such a massive target Muscle's entire torso, there had to have been some muscle fibers Deku could wrap together to cause a tie-up that'd be hard to recover from. So that explains that attack happening, when Muscular walked up with the lowest guard taunting Deku. But Ragnall chose the villain for a reason, and Muscular instantly moved his arms close, guarding against the attack, which with Muscular's skill and should have known 
of his own weaknesses, we can expect he'd set his muscles up to quickly pull back to block any sudden attack. Having Deku harmlessly hitting Musko's arm, missing the target. Being so close range with Muscular, Deku was flung away with a smaller hit as Muscular decided to continue over time beating Deku to death, not striking down immediately, not realizing the threat from Deku's original quirk. It'd be unrealistic Deku's original quirk would have stopped Muscular from hitting Deku away, even if it tried, but also with a failed plan requiring a lot of physical manipulation to wrap together the correct muscle fibers. Deku's original quirk also may have needed time to alter its strategy, which would have activated the freezing weakness, not able to turn off the physical manipulations as it readjusts the plan. Either way, the result was the same as Muscular didn't intend his attack to kill Deku, as he forcefully backhanded him away instead of using a killing attack, which could be scanned for, so no reason to dodge it. So it also may have understood that and allowed it to happen to give Deku distance. Next, Muscular's attack had a repeat of Deku's original quirk holding back his dodge to have Muscular not able to adjust, smashing him to the ground, but the speed Deku moved had him airborne again. But there was a lot of stone debris flying at Deku from the crater Muscular attack made, which with the sheer speed of the rocks and calculations I would have needed to know where they would be going, as they were just less than a second ago, one solid mass, Deku's original quirk could not calculate in time and Deku was pelted by the rocks, having one hit his head, but he is durable and didn't go down. Muscular again hit Deku mid air, but again the damage was reduced, leaving Deku stunned on the ground with all the new damages physical manipulation and pain reduction ability needs to adjust around. At this point Muscular was started speaking again, but was interrupted by Koda throwing a small rock at his head, and talking about how Muscular killed his parents giving Deku's original quirk plenty of time to adjust to physical manipulation and pain reduction. Despite that, Deku remained down for a long time, letting Muscular talk and face Koda, which has seen in many other cases Deku's original quirk was trying to make Deku not look to be needed to be focused on to launch a perfect counterattack at the best moment. Which when Deku attacked Muscular, it was doing when Muscular was highly focused on Koda raising his voice and the charging of his attack, with his muscle fibers moving everywhere that Deku could grab to launch a guaranteed to hit full powered one fall attack. Muscular as before turned around using his skill and battle awareness, but with all of his body a valid target, Deku successfully latched onto his muscles on his arm and Muscular was still adjusting his body to face Deku properly, so too slow to respond, allowing Deku's original quirk to have Deku full force punch Muscular right in the face to attempt to end the match again. The attack sent a shockwave flinging Koda off the cliff, which Deku's original quirk saw, but with how Deku's arms had so much damage, with one broken and the other shredded, by Deku using his one fall power at full force, Deku's original quirk had instead used Deku's mouth to grab Koda, which basically no one at all would have been that coordinated to do something like that. So clearly Deku's body movement was heavily controlled with physical manipulation from his original quirk. That correctly assumed the shockwave would endanger Koda, so made a plan to save Koda if Deku launches a full power one fall attack. Unfortunately, Muscular managed to activate his defenses of quirk with his incredible skill, preventing Deku from finishing him off or hurting him much at all, and kept him conscious. Which Deku's original quirk could see Deku only moved Muscular a short distance away, and Muscular was listening to them, not getting up immediately, so it'd be pointless to run, and Taki Muscular would just have Muscular beat Deku up sooner, so Deku's original quirk didn't interfere, and waited observing what will happen next. Which Muscular waited till when Deku said to Koda, let's head it back to camp to allow them to feel safe, when he reveals they are probably doomed. But as Muscular was talking, he adjusted his body for full strength, which Deku's original quirk didn't need Muscular to tell him he was going full strength by the scans taken, so adjusted, or used an on-standby plan to adjust. I'm lean to it was on standby due to the quickness of the change and scannable importance. But regardless, knowing the sheer damage that attack would cause, having the indirect attack would easily tear Koda apart. 
Deku's original quirk to protect most in need made Deku as a perceived precaution to not take any chances and tell Koda to grab onto him to dodge away, as Deku's arms couldn't effectively hold Koda due to the injuries which Koda did grab onto Deku and he dodged the attack. It is clear Muscular didn't follow through with another attack immediately, so potentially indicating that form had Muscular have trouble moving which wouldn't have come as a surprise with the sheer level of extra muscle fibers covering his body compared to the previous form. That delay was his time Deku's original quirk fully expecting an attack when Deku is in the air knew it couldn't reduce the damage enough to not have Koda and probably himself die, so had adjusted the strategy of dodging to aim for the rock wall to be able to jump away again from the expected follow up attack and he did dodge. But after they landed the shock wave threw them around and Koda lost his grip and they tumbled to the ground. With the current plan would just be doing the same thing over and over again and the first attempt had them in a bad shape. It was clear with the how they were sprawled on the ground from the first round they weren't going to be able to keep it up for long and have a high chance of dying if they attempted that again. Deku's original quirk knew it needed a new plan. His objective is seen before in many instances risking Deku to go in and save the ones in need. So Deku's original quirk had only one option left, to save Koda. It mentally manipulated Deku to have Deku understand the reasons he can't run with Koda and Koda couldn't survive anymore out there. Making Deku know to save Koda, Deku would have to go full force at Muscular a prolonged full power at one fall attack to hold Muscular off for a long time, allowing Koda to escape and keep telling Koda to run hoping the amount of time would allow Koda to hide, but with that move Deku would not be able to recover, leaving Deku at Muscular's non-existent mercy. So clearly Deku's original quirk decided to sacrifice Deku to fulfill the plan to save Koda. Deku's full power was able to prevent Muscle's full strength attack from killing him instantly, but slowly, but surely, Muscle's attack was pushing Deku back, driving him into the ground, which started crashing Deku. Which Deku continued to yell for Koda to run, hoping Koda can find somewhere to hide before Deku's death. Koda, in his emotional state, instead of running, fired off a water attack at Muscular. Whose muscular got distracted, partially letting off Deku, but Deku's original quirk still didn't have any options it could see. But fortunately, it was not out of options, because it has been shown there are powers it can't figure out, due to the limited brain parts it uses, and how one for all is so powerful it can only be partially scanned. Which this severe incident allowed a new power to come through, the maximum possible power, delivering the 1 million percent smash. It was so powerful, even so Muscular skillfully put up defenses, Deku punched through, smashing his head, defeating Muscular. But the backlash to Deku's body was so severe, later on Deku will be told his arms used was so damaged, if he used it any more for combat, he risked losing the full functionality of his arm. So now we are going to figure out what that new ability is. So far in the story, it has been shown One for All is not able to be fully scanned due to its immense power. And Deku's original quirk was only able to figure out a small amount at the beginning. But that also was due to the multi-personality brain parts separation as Deku is shown to have many brain parts that figures things out. So Deku's original quirk wouldn't have access to those forms of logic. Which Deku's original quirk quickly mastered what it could, but Deku without utilizing scanning had to grab the rest at a much slower pace. Which so far the only time new powers after the initial set of powers were mastered is when Deku figured it out. Then a new ability is scanned by Deku's original quirk to freely use it and enhance them to incredible levels. But since Deku's original quirk lacks morals, if this was what caused it then it would have fired off 1 million percent attacks a lot. Therefore it must not have access to it as we don't see it being actively used all the time. This does conflict therefore there had to have been a different reason, which a report from the doctor that treated Deku can explain what happened. The human body has inhibitors, preventing 100% use of our power, as that power would damage our body. But the situation Deku was in, severe emotional and physical strain, can have turned off those inhibitors. Which of it being off, the one for all 
1 million percent attack was able to be launched, which permanently damaged Deku's arms, and defeated Muscula. Since Deku's conscious mind has been separated into two people, and no matter how you split their consciousness, it would never have been able to access those subconscious inhibitors, due to the split happening on an entirely different set of brain parts. This separation of conscious and subconscious can explain where it came from and why it can't be freely used. So we can't expect Deku to never be able to use this attack from now on, unless things go really, really bad. And even then, the chances of activation would be low as turning off those inhibitors is no easy feat, even when facing death. And that concludes the failed assassination attempt against Deku and Koda, which soon after, Deku will rush back to Mandalay, Tiger and Pixie Bob saving them from Ragdoll, making Ragdoll completely fail at the assassination against the heroes but we can assume Ragdoll will not give up. That seems to be all the information stored here, so I'll end my video here. In the next event, the Kamina Ward Incident, we will get to see the consequences of everyone's actions. That now, with this research, the consequences won't be hidden, as the world is shaken to the core. This has been a Deer Runner, the Runner of Deer. Thanks for watching.